Alright, just making sure. In that case, let's open our Bibles together to the book of Romans, chapter 3, at verse 24. Romans 3.24 for our message from the Word of God this morning. Romans 3.24 will be found on page 1194 if you're using the church Bible today. Today being April 14th, 2024. Our text this morning will begin and end in Romans 3.24. We're going to park in this verse for a little while, as our beloved Dave Stewart used to say. And the title of this morning's message is Justified Freely by the Grace of God justified freely by the grace of God. And we begin with the story of a man who saw a newspaper ad one day that said free talking dog. So he went to the address that it listed and he saw a dog in the yard and he asked him so, are you the talking dog? And the dog said, Yeah, that's me. And the man was shocked and said, Wow, what's your story? And the dog said, Well, I learned to talk when I was just a puppy by listening to my owners. And once they knew I could talk, they auctioned me off, of course, and the CIA bought me and used me to spy on the Russians. And then, after the Cold War ended, the FBI bought me and used me to spy on the Mafia. I took down my bosses all over the country. And about that time, the dog's owner came out and the man said, This dog is amazing. Why are you giving him away for free? And the owner said, Because he's a liar. <laughs> he never did any of that stuff. That's the punchline. <laughs> well, while it might be fun to have a free talking dog, as believers, we've got something that's even better. We've been justified freely by the grace of God. At least that's what our Apostle Paul tells us in our very first and only verse this morning in Romans 3.24 where we read these words. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now, to begin with, you know what it means to be justified if you remember what I said about that legal term, justifiable homicide. If a man comes home and finds a bad guy attacking his wife and shoots and kills the bad guy, the law rules that to be a justifiable homicide. The man was justified in killing the attacker. So the word justify means to determine that someone is in the right. 
And that's how it's used when God told Moses in Deuteronomy 25.1, If there be a controversy between men, and they come unto judgment that the judges may judge them, then the judges shall justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. In other words, if a man accused another man of stealing from him and a controversy arose between them over it, and the judges determined that the man did steal from the guy, they were to condemn the thief and justify the man who accused him by determining that he was right to accuse him. But if the judges determined that the man had not stolen from the guy, then the judges justified the accused thief and said that he was in the right and condemned the man who accused him for bearing false witness against him. And for a couple of chapters now here in the book of Romans, Paul has been accusing mankind of having sinned against God. And he's produced enough evidence to prove it. So God, the judge of all men, is obligated to do what he told the Jewish judges to do in the very next verse in Deuteronomy 25 and verse 2. And it shall be, if the wicked man be worthy to be beaten, that the judge shall cause him to be beaten. Once it was proved that the thief was wicked or the accuser was wicked for bearing false witness, the wicked had to be punished. And now that Paul has proved that man has sinned against God, God is obligated to punish the wicked, just like he told the Jewish judges to do. The laws of justice demand it. But the punishment for sin isn't a beating. God says in Ezekiel 18 and verse 4, Behold, all souls are mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. All the souls of men belong to God because he created all the souls of men. And creations belong to their creators by virtue of creation. And God says that souls that sin have to be put to death. And we're not just talking about physical death here. The Word of God says in Revelation 21 verse 8 that murderers and whoremongers, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So sinners are worthy to be sent to the lake of fire, folks, right on down to the liars. But if that's so, how can Paul say in verse 24 that the judge of all men finds liars like you and me righteous and justifies the righteous instead of condemning us as the wicked lying sinners that we are? And the answer to that is found in a word that I left out from that list of sinners in Revelation 21.8. The unbelieving and all liars 
will have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. The very first thing mentioned in that list of condemned sinners is sinners who didn't believe the gospel. It's only unbelieving liars who have to go to the lake of fire. When you believed the gospel, your soul went from being condemned to being justified. So how'd that happen? <laughs> I mean, after all, God himself said in Exodus 23, 7, I will not justify the wicked. So, did God break his word he gave there when he justified wicked sinners like us just because we believe something he told us? Because if he did then it's true of him what it says in Proverbs 17, 15. He that justifieth the wicked and condemneth the just, even they both are abomination to the Lord. So, either God made himself abominable to himself when, when he justified us, or there's some other explanation. And there is, of course. It's found in what Paul told the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he, God, hath made him Christ to be sin for us, the Christ who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. God made Christ to be wicked for us as he hung on the cross. And then he condemned the wicked to death. And then, when we believe the gospel, God made us righteous in him. And then he justified the righteous. And now we are the righteousness of God. I know you've heard me say it many times, but I never get tired of saying it. God himself is no more righteous than you are because you've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. And that's how the judge of all men can determine that sinners like, our, like us are justified and in the right. You say, well, that's all well and good, but... I have sinned some more since I was justified. So am I still justified? And the answer to that is found in what Paul doesn't say in verse 24. He doesn't say we were justified, past tense. He says being justified. It doesn't matter how many times you've sinned since you believe the gospel. Paul says you're still justified. Present tense. If you slip up later today and sin, you can still open the word of God tomorrow. And you're going to find the words on the page didn't change overnight. And you're still as righteous as God himself in his eyes. If that makes you feel good, say amen. amen. <laughs> now, notice that Paul adds that we're justified freely. And the dictionary says that word freely means to do something without any hindrance, without any restraint without any opposition. It's really only remotely related to, to the cost of anything. What it means is, once God gave us his righteousness, there was nothing holding him back from justifying us. He could justify us freely, without restraint. That's how the word freely is used in Hosea 14.4. When God says, 
of the people of Israel. I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely. Once God heals those backsliding Jews in the kingdom of heaven on earth with spiritual healing, there'll be nothing holding him back from loving them freely. And as I said, once God made us righteous, there was nothing holding him back from justifying us. So he justified us freely. Now, later on in the book of Romans, Paul's going to talk about how you should live your life now that God has justified you freely. But for now, I don't want to leave you thinking that justification is a license to sin. So, let me give you a sneak preview of coming attractions in the book of Romans. <laughs> By showing you how David used that word freely in Psalm 54, verses 6 and 7. He said, I will freely sacrifice unto thee. For, the reason being, he hath delivered me out of all my trouble." After God delivered David out of all his trouble, folks, he chose to sacrifice to God freely with no restraint. He didn't let anything hold him back from expressing how thankful he was to God. He had freely received from God, so he freely gave back to God. Isn't that something the Lord said later in the book of uh, Matthew, I think it was? And do you know what that does to that verse that Paul writes to us in Romans 12, verse 1? I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's on the basis of the mercies of God that saved you from the lake of fire that Paul begs you to present your body a living sacrifice to him. And if you want to sacrifice like David did, you'll sacrifice yourself to God freely with no restraints, without letting, letting anything hold you back from giving yourself to Him. You have freely received from God. So you should freely give back to Him, don't you think? Paul calls that your reasonable service. But, when God saved us from the lake of fire, he didn't just save us by his mercy. Verse 24 says, He justified us by grace. Now Paul talks a lot about God's grace in the book of Romans. And I thought long and hard about the best way to tell you what grace is. And I think the best way to tell you what it is is to show you what it isn't. <laughs> In your next reference, in Romans 11 and verse 6, Paul's going to get to Romans 11 and say, And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. In other words, Grace is the opposite of work. If you do some work for a man, he owes you some kind of payment, as Paul says in Romans 4.4. 4. To him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. 
If you do some work for a man and he repays you, <laughs> he's not being gracious to you. He's paying you because he owes you a debt. You, you earned that payment by the work you did for him. And the wicked works that we did earned us eternal death. So God couldn't justify us by our works. He had to justify us by his grace. Now I know that this is diametrically opposed to how almost everybody thinks. Almost everybody thinks if their good works outweigh their bad works that God owes it to them to let them into heaven. And that he would be unrighteous if he didn't. I mean, what kind of God would not let you into heaven if you did more good things than bad things? But, if you're thinking that God owes you eternal life because you live a pretty righteous life that's filled with doing good works, Job 35, 7 has a question for you. If thou be righteous, what givest thou him? Or, what receiveth he of thine hand? In other words, what does God get out of it if you live a righteous life? I mean, shouldn't you live a righteous life? And if you should, why should God repay you for doing what you should do in the first place? That's what that verse is asking. Now, if you think God owes you eternal life because you give money to your church, it's because you don't understand that your money was his to begin with. <laughs> you say, well, how does that work? And your next reference, when King David was gathering the money that Solomon would need to build the temple, he gathered it from his people, of course, like any self-respecting governmental leader would do. <laughs> but he also cracked open his own wallet to help with the expenses of the temple. And look what he said about the money that he and his people gave to God in 1 Chronicles is it 1st Chronicles? I guess it is. 1st Chronicles 29, 1 to 4 and 14. David the king said, I have prepared with all my might for the house of my God the gold for things to be made of gold. Moreover, I have of mine own proper good of gold given to the house of my God over and above all that I prepared for the holy house even 3,000 talents of gold but who am I and what is my people that we should be able to offer so willingly for all things come of thee and of thine own have we given thee? Now listen. David had his own proper good. He got paid for being the king. I'm sure he was well paid. But he said that the money that he and his people gave out of their own proper good already belonged to God. And he meant by virtue of creation. If I could create a little model village of, of stores and factories and living people with living souls, I'd be the owner of all those stores and factories. And those souls would be mine. And I would also own the money that they earned from those factories. 
And when they went to church to worship me as their creator, <laughs> and when they put money in the offering box, they'd be just giving back to me what I already own. And God created the world we live in. So, whatever you're thinking this morning, don't think that if you give money to a church, that God owes you a debt. He doesn't owe men justification no matter how much money they give to the church and no matter how many good works they do. God justifies us by His grace and not by our works. So if you want to be justified, you have to believe the gospel that Christ died for your sins. And if you do, God will do what He told Hosea He would do for the Jews in Hosea 14, 1-4. O oh Israel, thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. Take with you words and turn to the Lord. Say unto Him, Take away all iniquity and receive us graciously. And I'll love them freely. If you'll believe the gospel, God will receive you graciously. And he'll freely and lovingly justify you. But now, the thing about grace is, it does way more than save you from the lake of fire and make you righteous in God's eyes. It gives you a seat in the, the house of the most powerful government in all creation, as Paul says in your next reference in Ephesians 2, verses 4 to 6. God, when we were dead in sin, spiritually dead, hath quickened us, made us alive together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and he made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We know from a lot of verses that the Lord Jesus Christ is seated at God's right hand in heaven. And since you're in Christ, you're seated with him in those heavenly places. And those places, there are places in God's government. That's how the word places can be defined in the dictionary. And it's how some unsaved Jewish leaders used that word when they were afraid the Lord was going to get too popular. And they said in John 11 48 if all men believe on him the Romans will take away our place and nation. Those unsaved Jewish leaders were afraid that if the Lord got too popular that, that the Romans would figure that he would make a better leader than they would. He, he'd keep the masses happier <laughs> and quieter and they'd appoint him to be Israel's king and they would lose their place as the leaders of the nation Israel. And folks, my point is, grace gives us a place in the leadership of heaven. And someday when we're seated in heavenly places physically, what's Paul say in 1 Corinthians 6.3? We'll judge angels. So now we're talking about more than just staying out of hell and being made righteous. Now we're talking about being made rulers. And let me ask you a question. If a man accuses you of stealing from him and a judge determines you didn't do it, 
Does the judge then hand you the key to the city and let you be the ruler of the city? But that's what grace does for us. On an infinitely grander scale, folks. The Lord justified us by His grace to give us a seat in heaven's government to help the Lord rule the heavenly city of New Jerusalem. John describes New Jerusalem in Revelation 22, 3, saying, The throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in New Jerusalem. And watch now. And his servants shall serve him. People ask me, what are we going to be doing? <laughs> oh, he turned, we're going to be serving the Lord. And we know from other scriptures, we're going to be serving the Lord by ruling the angels. But, before the Lord can let a, let a man serve him in his heavenly government, he has to do something about the fact that men are already somebody else's servant. As the Lord explained in John 8.34 when he said, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. Unbelievers are already the servants of sin because all men are the sons of Adam. Adam was created a servant of God. But when he sinned, he sold himself into slavery, into bondage to sin. And every man who has ever sinned since Adam has also sold himself to sin and become what Romans 7.14 calls soul under sin. So, before a man can serve God in his government, the Lord has to redeem him out of the service of sin. That's why verse 24 there says that God justified us by grace, but also through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. The dictionary says that that word redeem means to buy something back. When a store gives you a coupon or you get one in the mail and you bring it back to them on your next visit, they buy it back from you by giving you money off of your next purchase, right? When I was a kid, stores gave out S&H green stamps. Smile if you remember S&H green stamps. <laughs> stores gave them out with purchases, all kinds of different stores. And you'd, you'd paste them into these little books, and I remember that part because my mother made me paste them in the little books. She, she did the Tom Sawyer thing. She made it look like fun. See, this is fun. Don't you want to be real? And so, yeah, oh yeah, I'll do it, Mom. <laughs> but the S&H company would redeem those stamps or buy them back from you at a place called the Redemption Center. It was like a, a catalog store. And did you know that in the 1960s, the Sperry and Hutchinson Company, that's the S&H, issued more stamps than the United States Post Office. That's <laughs> hard to believe before the email when everybody was had to do stamps. To... But listen, those stamps had to be redeemed before they could be used to buy anything. And men have to be redeemed before they can become the servants of God. But in the Bible, there are rules that have to be followed to redeem things. If a Jew was poor in Bible days, he could sell some land and it could be redeemed or bought back. As you see when Leviticus 25 
24 and 25 talks about a redemption for land. If thy brother be poor and sold some of his possession, sold some of his land, he couldn't sell his inheritance land, but he could sell his income property. If any of his kin come to redeem it, then shall he redeem that which his brother sold. Land couldn't be redeemed by just anybody. It had to be redeemed by one of the man's kinfolk, as they say down south. <laughs> In other words, only a relative could redeem the land that you hocked. <laughs> and land wasn't the only thing that you could sell if you were a poor Jew. If you were really poor, you could sell your son into bondage. That's what happened in Nehemiah 5.5 5, where it says we bring into bondage our sons neither is it in our power to redeem them. And here you thought your parents treated you like a slave when you were a kid. <laughs> but in Bible days your son had to work as a slave until he paid your debt. Unless one of your kin could redeem him and, and buy him back from his master. Now, if you were really, really poor, and you were fresh out of sons to sell, <laughs> you could sell yourself into bondage, as it says in Leviticus 25, 47 and 48. If thy brother wax poor and sell himself, he may be redeemed again. Well, things are really bleak if you had to sell yourself into bondage, right? But if you did, all you needed was someone who could afford to pay off your debt. But now, here's another rule. It couldn't be just any of your kinfolk who could redeem you. It had to be what we call your next of kin. As it says in Leviticus 25, 47, uh, 48 and 49, I should say. One of his brethren may redeem him, his uncle or his uncle's son may redeem him, or any that is nigh of kin. If his uncle is nigh of kin to him, or his uncle's son is nigh of kin, he may redeem him, or if he be able, he may redeem himself. Your closest next of kin is you yourself. And if you were to inherit some money, or come by it through some other kind of windfall, you could redeem yourself. But after you, it had to be your next of kin who had to redeem you. But he had to be able to redeem you. If he couldn't, it fell to the next next of kin. When Boaz, in your next reference, when Boaz asked Ruth's nearest kin to buy her land, it says in Ruth 4, 6 and 8, the kinsman said, I, I cannot redeem it for myself. Redeem thou my right to thyself. Therefore the kinsman said to Boaz, Buy it for thee. Boaz was Ruth's next of kin after that guy. So when that guy couldn't redeem it, he relinquished his right to redeem Ruth's land to Boaz. Now, the question is, why did God attach all of these picky rules to redemption? And the answer is that God knew Men needed to be redeemed from sin. 
And to be fair, he wanted to give men a lot of different options as how to get redeemed from their sins. I mean, what could be more fair than to give men the option to redeem themselves from sin? But as we saw in that Leviticus 25 reference there, a slave could only redeem himself if he's able to redeem himself. And we've already seen that men can't redeem themselves from sin because everything a man owns, God owns by virtue of creation. So men aren't able to redeem themselves. And everything that their kinfolk owns, God owns too. So it says in Psalm 49, 6 to 8, they that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them, none of them can by any means redeem his brother for the redemption of their soul. So, mankind was in a real pickle, folks. Because there wasn't a man on the planet that could redeem them from their sins. So 2,000 years ago, God sent us a man who wasn't on the planet to redeem us. As it says in Hebrews 2, 14 and 15, where it says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood. He also took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to slavery, to bondage. Unsaved men are the loyal subjects of sin. But Christ can redeem us from sin because he became kin to us. So the thing that started out looking like a picky rule about needing a kinsman to redeem things ended up being the thing that God used to redeem us from our sins. But <laughs> the problem is, the problem for us Gentiles is, look at that Hebrews 2 reference again. You see the word children there in the first line? The children it's talking about there, folks, are the children of Israel. And you know that because in the very next verse, in verse 16, it says, He took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on the seed of Abraham. Jesus Christ didn't become a man to die for men, folks. He became a Jew to die for Jews. Do you know what they called the payment that was paid to redeem a man? Psalm 49, 7 tells us when it says, none can by any means redeem his brother nor give to God a ransom for him. And who did the Lord say he came to ransom in Matthew 20, 28? The Son of Man came to give his life a ransom for many. And we know he meant the many in Israel. Because when the Lord was born, that angel told his father, in, well, his father Joseph, in Matthew 1.21, Call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And his people were the seed of Abraham. And that left Gentiles like us out in the cold, right? But the genius of God is that in order to become a Jew to ransom Jews, he had 
had to become a man so he could also ransom men. Any man. Even Gentile men. But God kept that a secret until he revealed it to the Apostle Paul in the mystery. As you see in 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6, it says Christ Jesus gave himself a ransom to redeem all to be testified in due time. And the due time came when the Lord revealed the mystery to Paul. And the reason God set up the rules of redemption that way wasn't just to be fair to us and given us a lot of ways to be just uh, to be redeemed. He set it up that way to be gracious to us so we could reign with Christ in heaven over the angels. I mean, think it through. The only thing that justifying you did was find you righteous in God's eyes. If God didn't also redeem you, all you would have been was a righteous servant to sin. And God couldn't hire you to serve in his government if you were still serving sin because, as the Lord also said later, no man can serve two masters. That's why we had to be justified there in verse 24 by grace, but through the redemption that's in Christ. Now listen. There's plenty of other men who are nigher of kin to us than Christ Jesus. It's like, I get you, they talk about six degrees of separation. Well, but listen, none of them are able to redeem us. So it falls to him as our next to next to next to next to next of kin, right? And all of this explains something that, frankly, I used to find puzzling when I first started studying the Bible, something the Lord said in Matthew 6.12, when he said, Forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Now, I know he was teaching the apostles to pray and ask God to forgive their sins and their trespasses because... Well, I'll go home and look up Luke's version of the Lord's Prayer, and that's what Luke says. Forgive us our sins. But I could never figure out why, why Matthew's version said debts. But now I know it's because sins are debts. Debts that we owe to God. And that's not just a Bible term. There's a lot of talk these days about the government offering forgiveness on the debts of student loans. So we still talk that way. And it explains why in the Bible, in your next reference, the redemption of sins is tied to the forgiveness of sins. Speaking about Christ in Colossians 1.14, Paul says, In whom, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. In that context, that word even there means equal. Redemption and forgiveness are even. They're equal. To redeem a man's soul, the Lord has to forgive a man's debt of sin. And that's why it's so very dangerous to say what some very good grace pastors and teachers are saying these days, that Christ forgave all men when he died for them instead of when they believed the gospel. Because if unsaved men are forgiven, they're also redeemed. And they can sing with you, redeemed how I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And once you start giving unbelievers things like redemption and forgiveness of sins, 
that can lead to giving them justification and salvation and eternal life. And the laws of God's justice can't let that happen. The laws of God's justice have to be satisfied. A ransom has to be paid. And verse 24 says, Redemption is in Christ Jesus. So if you're not in Christ Jesus, you're not redeemed or forgiven. Colossians 2.14 says, In Christ we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our sins. And unsaved men aren't in Christ. Now, if you're not saved this morning, you need to know what is going to happen to you if you die thinking you can be saved by doing good works or giving money to some church or other. The Lord told a parable in your last reference about a servant who made his Lord angry. And it says in Matthew 18, 34, His Lord delivered him to the tormentors till he pay all that was due unto him. Go home and read that parable. I, I didn't have room to give you very much of it. But what the Lord was trying to teach there is that if you're not saved, you've angered God with your sin debts. And if you die without Christ, God will deliver you to the tormentors in hell until you've paid your debt. And if you're too poor to redeem yourself now, just wait till you get to hell. I mean, if you don't have anything God wants now, you're going to have even less in the lake of fire. And if you have to stay there till you've paid all you owe, you're going to have to stay there for eternity. Why not believe that Christ paid the ransom that you couldn't pay? And if you will, God will redeem you. You know, when Abraham Lincoln was still a lawyer in Springfield, he'd, he'd keep a ledger book of men who owed him money for the legal work that he did. And sometimes, I can still remember seeing the words on the page that I read in Carl Sandburg's biography of Abraham Lincoln. Sometimes <clears throat> he would write after a debt in his ledger, forgiven, too poor to pay. He had to write it to, to balance the books in his ledger. And that is what Jesus Christ is willing to do for you. Balance the books with you if you'll just believe on Him. Heavenly Father, we do pray that if there be one here today who has not believed on Him, that they'll, from this message, understand that they can't possibly redeem themselves. And we thank you as believers for the ransom that the Lord Jesus Christ paid for our sins. And we thank you in his name. Amen. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love, the fellowship of